webinar. Uh, I'll be your moderator for today, and in the room here, I'm joined uh, by Ben Cooper. Uh, ben is the general manager for our local service company uh, based out of the Twin Cities. Uh, he's responsible for Rainbow's Tree Care, Lawn Care, and Structural Pest Control Division, uh, and we're very excited to have uh, Ben join us today. A couple of things before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, in order to get your ISA CEU uh, for uh, this webinar, uh, you'll want to enter your ISA certification number into the questions and chat box uh, right now. Uh, again, uh, enter your ISA certification number into the uh, questions and chat box for your ISA CEU. Uh, during this webinar, if you have any questions, uh, you can also type those questions into that uh, same questions and chat box and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, without much further ado, I'd like to welcome Ben. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, as Peter had said, uh, my name is Ben Cooper, and I'm the general manager with Rainbow Tree Care, uh, Lawn Care, and Structural Pest Experts uh, here in uh, Minnetonka, Minnesota, um, here in the Twin Cities. And I will uh, be presenting on uh, how to build a fantastic plant healthcare team. Before I start that, I actually just came out of a uh, um, about 30 minute time frame that I set aside to make some sponsorship phone calls. I'm a proud member of our uh, Saluting Branches um, Arborists United for uh, Veterans Remembrance uh, organization and team. And uh, so it just reminded me that I should make sure I, I bring this out to everybody's attention. For those of you who haven't heard about it, um, we serve uh, veteran cemeteries across the country. Last year it was uh, 34 locations. This year we're up to about 50 different locations. I've got the map up here in front of us. Um, and we're expecting probably 2,000 or so arborists across the country to come together on uh, September 20th, 2017 for a fantastic day of service. So really excited. This will be our third year. If you've not participated in a uh, day of service just in general, it's just a fantastic way to give back and work um, arm in arm with somebody who you might normally be a competitor with. Uh, so anyway, you can find the website at salutingbranches.org and there's a map, so uh, take a look and uh, I will get into uh, the presentation that you are all here for today. So starting off, uh, Peter <clears throat> had given some background and context on who I am um, a little bit more. I am an I'm an arborist. Uh, I, that, that's my my formal training, um, and have learned a lot here in my years. Um, I spent a significant amount of time as a production manager within our company. Um, about eight years of my career, and uh, worked in creating all of the the teams that went out and executed on our work. Our plant healthcare teams, our pruning and removal teams, uh, injection teams, uh, you name it. I pulled together teams and did training uh, and managed all of the day-to-day -day activities. So I'm going to get into uh, uh, hopefully some of the, the ways that I've found to manage uh, that team and how what's worked well for me. And this is just my perspective. There's so many different ways out there uh, to do this, but this is this is going to be my perspective. So a little bit more background on on our company. Um, like I had said, we've, we've been established here um, in the Twin Cities market since about 1977. Um, we're celebrating just over, uh, just at 40 years of, of service. Uh, we have two offices located here in the Twin Cities. Um, we are an ESOP company, employee-owned. We deliver a lot of different protocols, and that's kind of some of the pieces that I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have over 190 employees that are peak um, of uh, of the season. Uh, we're just ramping up right now. Um, we have more than 50 certified arborists on staff, um, and we're also a uh, TCIA accredited company. And uh, for those of you who are out there who are private businesses, if you're not accredited, um, everything that I'm going to talk about here today, um, accreditation really gives you a leg up and gives you some uh, um, direction in how to do some of the things I'm going to talk about. So, I mean, this is this is really timely for me, and we actually have a, um, a team of about 20 new uh, technicians here 
Um, in our office currently, uh, training for the spring season, the snow has finally melted. We finally hit some 60s, and uh, we are ready to uh, deliver on the promises that we've made to our customers. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review the, the five <clears throat> major points that I see in a good production management of a, of a plant healthcare team. Um, the first points will be around recruiting and hiring, and I know every, a lot of arborists and a lot of uh, um, other owners of, of businesses um, definitely struggle in this area of recruiting and hiring and, and finding the right people, so we'll touch on that. We'll talk about training, we'll talk about safety uh, and quality and efficiency as we walk through uh, the different areas here. So starting with recruitment, you know, and and for me, this one of the cornerstones of, of good recruiting is that you're always recruiting. Um, every single one of your employees is a recruiter, but there's there's never there's never a place that that you shouldn't be thinking about uh, how can I how can I be recruiting? And uh, part of that is being the employer of choice. Um, I've had the opportunity with Rainbow Rainbow Tree Care that established that. Uh, a number of years ago, and we've, we've maintained that, that integrity, I guess, around who we are and, and desire for folks to come and work for us. Um, whether that's participation in uh, the tree climbing uh, championship uh, here locally, um, being volunteers in all sorts of other ways within our own local uh, Minnesota Society of Arboriculture, or whether that's going to the University of Minnesota or the University of Stevens Point and talking to students and working with uh, faculty there um, to be a uh, you know a hands-on arborist and give some some lessons, um, but it's really it that's really one important way that we've maintained ourselves um, out and above uh, the competition is to is to be an employer of choice. One of the other pieces is know what you need to pay. Um, here, here in Minnesota, the, the job market is uh, booming. Uh, unemployment is at uh, all-time lows right now, so finding um, employees, period, can be really difficult. And if you're the, the lowest um, common denominator out there and paying the lowest wages, that's typically what you're going to get. So you can't be afraid to, to make sure that you know what the going rate is for your roles and even pay a little bit more sometimes. Um, but you, we, I've gotten caught in, in that loop uh, before. We do a lot of, we, we have the um, advantage here that we actually have a full-time uh, person who is a recruiter, which uh, we've only done in the last few years, but um, we do spend a significant amount of time um, on social media. Uh, we also spend a lot of time on Indeed, and then there's other you know, forms of uh, connection with LinkedIn and things like that that are out on the internet that we found are, are very successful in finding employees. And again, like I kind of started with, um, your, your current employees can be your best and your worst recruiters, so you got to know what those conversations are and encourage your employees to uh, you know, share the same uh, um, feeling as, as you do for your business. Uh, some of the other things that I talked about just as far as uh, you have a seasonal pool of employees. What is it that, that we can do with those folks? Um, because maybe they, you know, they end at the end of the plant healthcare season, and uh, they're moving on, and, and they're unemployed for four months. How can you? How can we hold on to those folks? So, you always uh, obviously need to ask at the end of the summer, and if there's any opportunity to now at that point uh, offer up um, their new wage coming in the next year, you you put this entire season of work. Um, in efficiency, in having them understand exactly what is needed um, to get the job done. That employee is extraordinarily valuable. Make sure that they see that. Make sure you do a review. Make sure that you um, increase their, their, their wage at that point. Keep in touch with those employees over the course of the winter. Uh, offer extra incentives, um, you know, hiring bonuses for coming back in. Um, and if there are folks that they're graduating college or something like that, ask if they know other folks who you could reach out to. So for hiring, values is an absolute must. Um, I've hired folks for the last 10 years into, into our business, 
And uh, that is the cornerstone of where I start in the uh, interview process is to make sure that their values fit. Uh, once that happens, most of what um, needs to happen, or much of what needs to happen can be taught. Um, but if they're not a values fit, it's not going to last very long. Uh, I suggest having a couple of people from your company interview, gives good perspective. And uh, also some of the other basics is just make sure you're checking driving records and criminal background prior to the offer as a condition that's just part of our, um, uh, our operation at this point. But uh, you can save yourself a lot of headache um, by doing those two things uh, prior to hire or as a contingency of hire. So moving off of uh, hiring and on to training. And like I say, with, uh, with good values um, match employees, a lot can be done in training, but you need to have a structure. Um, and so we happen to have the ability to house all of our training um, in, in one place. Uh, we call it our ROOTS program. And we go through approximately about a five-day onboarding process within our company. Um, and the first day is really bringing people into the values that, that we hold within the company. Some of the basic uh, HR uh, formalities that need to be handled. The second day we go through some basic uh, technical training that kind of crosses the, the gamut of uh, whether it be a wear, um, PPE, uh, proper lifting, all those types of things. Then we get into um, some of the very specific technical training um, on the third and fourth day. And that's where we are currently. Like I say, we have a plant health care group, we have a lawn care group, and they share a lot of common links up to this point. And then on the first, third and fourth day, they split off and actually start to do their own uh, distinguished, very specific training, learning about on the plant health care side, learning the insects and the diseases that they're going to be handling for the season learning how to handle uh, customer questions and inquiries and, and breakdowns and complaints and things like that. Uh, and then a portion of that is also very hands-on, working out in the shop with our, our mechanic, uh, working with the other technical trainers out there and really understanding all the equipment that they're going to use uh, out in the field. And then we spend a, a significant amount of time uh, uh, shadowing where they'll actually pair up with a, another more senior technician and work with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, side by side, typically for at least a week, um, sometimes longer, until we're confident that they can go through the checklist of uh, competencies uh, that are going to be required to do the job. And we also do checkups after that. And again, not coming from a place of how can we find the mistakes that uh, these new technicians are making, but where can we help improve their ability and their accountability within this job. We, we take that very seriously, but that's a, that's a missing piece sometimes uh, with just grabbing new people, giving them the one-day crash course, and throwing them to the wolves. Uh, I've, I've been there and done that too, and uh, I can tell you that this is far more effective. Some other ways that we uh, continue training are ongoing safety meetings. Uh, we have weekly safety meetings. We also do annual first aid, CPR, EHAP, and AWARE training. And this is actually some of the, the TCIA accreditation information um, that I'm giving you here. And then we also do reviews, consistent reviews and feedback. Like I say, when we're out doing uh, um, site visits and checks, we're not out um, to be the police. We're out to um, create an improved employee. And that's what reviews do, too. They give people something to, to work for. And we also, uh, um, we also push uh, for continuing education. So if folks want to become ISA certified, CPSP, any of those types of things, uh, we provide them uh, with pathways in order to get that. And there's a number of different roles within our company, not just sales related, but also uh, technical related that require ISA certification or CPSP in order to hold that role within our company. And then we provide them with the time uh, to do continuing education, get out and hear what else is going on. You know, we work in our own little bubble sometimes within our own company and you need to get out. I just I like this presentation here and hear what else is going on out in the rest of the industry.
here's just a quick outline. I'm not going to dive into a lot of detail here, but this is just an example of the way we lay out um, our agenda and our training and uh, going through in a, in a methodical way and having all the PowerPoints and uh, materials all saved into one spot so when we go into training it's easily accessible and consistent every time and we know exactly who the trainers are. entire three pages. So safety. I can't say enough about safety in the in the tree industry. It is absolutely the pinnacle of uh, any any good company. Without it, nothing else is going to work. And so the way that we take this on uh, is that we hold a TCIA accredited or accreditation um, and we also have CTSPs, so C, uh, uh, certified tree care safety professionals on board um, who are experts in taking the materials uh, that we have and training up the rest of our team. Uh, we've been an accredited company since 2005 and this is completely um, on your own. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, you invite the TCIA to come in and be a part of your business and help you look through your processes and improve your own business. And uh, we, we actually just got done with our probably sixth one here uh, about a month ago, and I learned something new every single time. And I never look at it like, oh, the, the police are coming or OSHA is coming or something like that. This is uh, a company that, that we pay or an organization that we pay to come in and partner with us and figure out how we can improve um, our business. Uh, so through that, you do an accreditation process that happens every three years, and we also have, like I said, uh, CTSPs. It's both a requirement to have a certain number per uh, uh, number of employees that you have, but also these are the folks who can now uh, become your trainers uh, out in the field. Other things that we think about in safety, um, specifically in plant health care, is product selection. So it's built into our um, processes when we develop new protocols and how we're going to, to manage different insects or diseases that are out there. Um, we're going to consider all the different products. Like clearly, you need to select the product that's going to work, but if there's also an alternative product that might be safer for your employees, we're going to lean towards uh, selecting um, that product. Alternatively, um, and, and the other area is engineering control, like making sure that uh, you, your technicians, when they go out, they're safe. And we really go above and beyond um, that here within my company. Uh, we require with all spraying um, that folks are are wearing uh, all of their PPE. So they wear a respirator, they wear a full Tyvek suit, uh, nitrile gloves, and rubber boots. Um, it's imperative that that we and our employees are, are being safe and uh, using the proper PP when they're doing their THC certification. Another piece of safety within our company is uh, having buy-in throughout the entire business. It's not just your technical team that's out running chainsaws or out driving, you know, heavy trucks, uh, you know, filled with uh, apple scabs. Spray. It's everybody. Um, and so we have a safety council, um, and their commitment is, is what we say here, is that we are the leaders of the well-being of our employees and those whom we interact with. We are committed to courageously and actively caring for each other. We stand for direct, honest, and complete communication. And the accountability of this team, which is made up of executives and managers and, uh, you know, technicians that have been here for six months, to really get that widespread um, experience of the company. Uh, they're responsible for, for carrying and creating this culture of safety. Uh, they review safety policies. They do inspections. They do incident investigations. And I'm going to go a little bit more into incidences. Uh, and they also review and in, uh, investigate any safety concerns that an employee might have. They're, they're an opening uh, for folks to hear that. And they also help with training. 
this is a this is a piece that um, through our TCIA audit, we found that we were not doing a very good job of, and it's critically important in having a safe company um, in identifying and managing your incidences. And this just isn't the ideally you're starting with the incidences that are happening, you know, the accident, not the accidents, but the uh, um, the occurrences that are out there right now in the field, but ultimately you're working towards folks really picking up on those and identifying those before they happen, or, you know, a good catch or a near miss. We've learned a lot from these. Um, and within incident reporting, there's a lot of work that can be done in improving your company and finding out where you're inadequate. And so if you're not tracking your incidences or don't have a formalized way, I really encourage you um, to look into that. And this goes into the this goes into quality, as I had said. When we after we have new employees and get them trained in, we are doing uh, a lot of different site inspections. So we have supervisors in each area. We have about eight different areas of focus, and I'll I'll get into that a little bit later in this presentation. But in each one of those areas, we have supervisors that are going out and they're um, ongoingly checking in on these on these on these new employees and making sure that we're following through with everything that we promise to our customers and everything that we promise to our employees um, as regards to their their personal safety so at the beginning of the season the intervals are a little bit uh, heavier and as we continue on through the through the season and everyone becomes more confident and we're more confident then they start to subside a little bit but this is just a simple checklist that we develop that covers safety, uh, quality, image, whatever you wanted to, to look at on a sheet like this, you could develop this. But this develops consistency and continuity and starts to match up uh, your employees with areas that they're you know, maybe not as proficient in as they could be. So now, uh, kind of shifting gears completely out of uh, onboarding uh, recruiting, safety, and quality. This is looking a little bit more at efficiency. So, how do I how do I start to develop, you know, who I might need um, to bring on in my team? How do I forecast out, and how will I uh, how will I know um, if we're we're getting a return uh, for what we're looking for that's profitable? So we we spend quite a bit of time forecasting. Um, you know, we're already into, into 2017, we're a quarter into 2017, and each year, uh, the prior year, we spend a significant amount of time forecasting out exactly what will this year look like. Uh, matching up our sales goals uh, with the equipment we have and ultimately the employees and the, and the delivery dates. Um, without this, uh, you're, you're setting yourselves up for a very difficult uh, recruiting season, um, you know, going into going into January and February without a clear idea of how many new employees you're going to need to bring on um, puts you at a at a disadvantage. So going through and at least sitting down and spending a day, uh, even if it is the busy season, kind of speculating out as to what this can look like, and you're going to need to know. You're going to have to have a, a tie to your metrics. You're going to have to understand. Uh, what it is that you're measuring and how you can can get a foothold and understand exactly how many people and how many tools you're you're going to need. So spend some time getting this done in advance. On efficiency. So how do I know if my employees are out uh, returning, you know, at a level that is profitable for my business? And again, we, we spend a, a, a considerable amount of time uh, focused in on this. So you need to understand uh, what what your employees are doing. So we we look at two key figures, and I you know a lot of other tree companies I've talked to um, look at a similar metric, but we really look at on-site activities, you know, things that are directly related uh, to completing that job. You know, when the truck shows up and pulls up on the curb. Uh, to the time the door knocking is completed, to the time I leave my door hanger and uh, and head out. 
And then we also look at these non-on-site hours. Um, so all the other hours that are associated with you know, preparation for the day, getting all of my products loaded, getting water in the truck, uh, driving to the job, all those different types of activities are in that non that non site. And these are metrics that we look at with our technicians. It's not the only one. Like I say, we have quality and safety um, uh, prior to that. Uh, but this is one of the areas that we look at. And this gives us a lot of direction uh, on how we can forecast the, the next season and also how we can better price um, our jobs. Um, if we know exactly how long these jobs take, we can now start to formulate much better pricing and improve our pricing uh, in the same way. <clears throat> so going into our delivery process. So this is going to go into a little bit deeper dive on how we schedule, the type of equipment we use for our plant healthcare, um, and how we approach uh, the job site as far as uh, plant healthcare services go. So within our scheduling uh, area, we have 11 operational subgroups in the midst of the busy time of the year, and I'll go through those on the next uh, slide. We organize ourselves around service codes within our system. We're also able to organize our services uh, by phenology in some cases. So by uh, phenology is, is against uh, what we measure as growing degree days. We can estimate you know, approximately uh, when uh, the apple scab applications are going to need to go, or maybe some more obscure, you know, uh, um, leaf gall um, is going to need to go out the door. So we cluster our, our work into these phenological groups and then also operational groups. Um, so, you know, your services like uh, your pruning and removal, which don't necessarily have a timing. It's more when, when can you get to it so that the customer is, uh, is happy with the results. Um, and then we also look at something called promise dates. So we're managing our workload all the time throughout the entire season, matching up uh, our expectations that our consulting arborist sales group is setting against what is possible uh, through our uh, production team. So these are the these are the different operational groups that we look at at Rainbow Tree Care. Uh, so within pruning, we look at climbing and ornamental and stump grinding. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, within our, our tree care or plant health care uh, division, we have soil applied insecticides. We have uh, fertilization services. Um, and then we have uh, different uh, spray application uh, services that go out the door. And then we have completely different subsections of uh, tree injections. Uh, this is a totally different group of employees that are out injecting trees for Dutch elm disease, for oak wilt, uh, and for emerald ash borer. Here in the Twin Cities, it's becoming ever more prevalent. Uh, and so we've got an entirely separate team that's out uh, delivering emerald ash borer uh, treatments. And then we have a soil care area. So this is the team that uh, utilizes the airspace to do root color uh, excavations and also uh, um, incorporate soil in it. And each one of these areas has a completely different expectation as far as their uh, efficiency and return per hour. When we look at scheduling, this is our own homegrown system. Uh, we call it White Oak. Uh, it's fairly sophisticated in the number of codes and protocols that it holds, but it gives us the ability to uh, have our sales folks uh, very clearly communicate exactly what it is that they're intending on delivering to this customer. It's not just handwritten proposals. Uh, it's clearly articulated in each one of these codes. So like, for example, I don't know, this might be a little bit small for some of you to see, but uh, we have Cooley Spruce Gall, Adelgid, and there may, there's, there's different ways uh, to approach this uh, particular insect. You know, you might be getting one application, you might be getting two. It just depends on what your, your tolerance for damage um, for that particular insect is. So we really drill down a lot of detail in those service codes, and we also do that in, in, in our pruning division. 
um, it's not just prune tree. It's, you know, crown clean to X number of inches with very specific canopy uh, raises. We even designate specific branches that need to come off the tree. And those are all a series of drop downs um, and add-ins on the, on the service codes that creates a level of continuity as our company has grown um, to make sure that we're communicating and, and training on the exact same things and our delivery is clearly uh, laid out. So within these codes, as I said, we have different ways of delivering, phenological and operational. Uh, and phenological is by, uh, by growing degree day. And so during the year, um, right now, we're, uh, we're, I think, at zero to growing degree days here in Minnesota. We maybe had a couple the other day. Uh, but we're working up towards uh, a number of services coming due. And we have the ability to, to look and identify what is in our system so that we can make sure that we're delivering on the promises that we made. So we're not trying to fumble through a list of different uh, services that are out there. We know very clearly uh, what's where, when it needs to go, and then we can create these groups and pull these different service codes onto these custom lists, and then we can have those go to our, our scheduling group, and they can uh, contact customers and send those out the door. Um, but that's a pretty distinct thing that we do that I know other, other companies I've, I've spoken with do, but we have a pretty um, I think great system uh, for managing that. And here's another view of, of our scheduling system. It's really busy. There's a lot of stuff going on, but we have all sorts of different ways that we can identify and match up, uh, you know, delivery timing with uh, geography, um, with uh, equipment, uh, for example, um, all sorts of different ways. And so once, once you've identified exactly what services that you want to deliver, uh, this would be an example of the screen that we have that just pulls up and now a scheduler can uh, work off of in uh, generating work for a crew. So on scheduling, uh, our, our teams, uh, like I say, after that screen that I had just shown, uh, we select work for a specific technician. Uh, we route it most, efficient, most efficiently once we've chosen it. We still use uh, MapBook pages um, to get the first look at where we're going to go. I know there's a lot of different softwares that are out there and available. And then we put it into a, a map point or a routing efficiency software to most optimize you know, the, the route that that particular technician has these uh, next. Um, and each customer is notified through email or phone. And like I say, um, we're in an inquiry right now as to like what we're going to use for our future software because our own homegrown solution is getting somewhat dated, as you can see. There's a lot of different softwares out there on the market that do both of these things really well. Uh, and once we do that, our work is posted to the technician. And uh, all of the product that they're going to need in Plan Healthcare is pulled uh, prior and literally packaged up for the technician so they know exactly what they're going to need for the, for the upcoming day. So when they show up, they're grabbing the work orders, they're grabbing the product, they've already filled up with their uh, water the night before, whatever they need, so they're ready to roll out the door. They're not doing a lot of uh, work around. And that's not something we had for um, a number of years, but I would definitely encourage those of you who have plant healthcare areas um, to consider having one point of contact um, when organizing your, uh, your product and inventory to send out the door for the next day, both from the standpoint of efficiency, uh, but also for, um, um, uh, what am I trying to think of here? Uh, your loss, you know, just not in, not necessarily in stolen, which is is a possibility, but uh, with uh, just product wasted or product lost in the you know the back of your truck or whatever it happens to be, you just can keep a much closer rein on what exactly it is that you're you're using. Going into the equipment, 
Uh, we have a, a large plant health care group. Um, we have uh, 15 uh, plant health care trucks. Um, and we have a number of different configurations. So I just want to give everybody a, an overview of this. I think Peter had said that he pulled this together in a PDF uh, slideshow and we'll have it available for folks who want to take a little bit closer look at this. Um, but I'll run through the different ways that we've configured our trucks and things that we've thought about. So my considerations have been uh, mainly from the standpoint of uh, volume. You know, what do we need to mix up? What are we trying to deliver? You know, high volume, medium volume, and low volume, and low volume um, within our company has become more and more prevalent with uh, um, lower uh, or higher concentration uh, soil applied insecticides and things of that nature have reduced our, our need to have these, you know, 1,500 gallon uh, spray tanks. You know, there's, there's only a handful of things that we're actually out doing overhead sprays for now. Um, and then, of course, fertilization. So our highest volume trucks here, um, we use uh, um, a product made here locally. Um, Minnesota Water makes it. Um, I know they sell trucks all over the country, but that's what we use. Uh, they have a really nice cab over model. Bought um, a new one this past year. They carry about 560 gallons worth of, of product, uh, which is fairly high volume. I know they make some bigger ones. We don't find that those are necessary. Uh, they have a very heavy duty pump, um, and one of the big benefits of this particular truck is that it can it can move larger particles. Um, and so we have a few particulates, um, especially within our fertilizer, that do not break down in water. They're not water soluble. Um, and so we need to be able to move those particulates through and this pump um, gives, that, gives us that capability. The other benefit that there used to be that we don't use as much anymore is uh, for uh, um, doing large tree spraying. Uh, you know, like spraying oak trees and elm trees used to be a pretty common practice here. But like I say, there's a lot of uh, soil applications that can accomplish the same thing. But those big heavy duty pumps will do that. Um, typically have multiple tanks. I think in most of these configurations, you're going to find that they have multiple tanks. Our newest one that we just bought uh, actually has, I think, five different tanks. And so they've actually given uh, the ability to mix in smaller volumes, which is fantastic. That was one of the things that was missing before. They typically come with two hoses. Um, a little bit heavier duty truck. We, we've had uh, Isuzu or Kino cab overs. They're an 18,000 GVW. You can get away with not having a, uh, um, a CDL driver on these trucks, which is a, is a benefit. Uh, um, they are powered by the truck. They're run off of a PTO. Um, so they're all integrated as one unit. Some of the pros of these is that you can get out for the day. Um, uh, more often than not, sometimes these trucks will have to come back once or they'll have to go refill once. If you have a need to even, you know, there are the next size up where you don't ever have to fill. You can go out for the entire day um, uh, and fill up a thousand gallons. And then they also are, have this ability to move uh, coarser material um, through the pumps, uh, larger material. Some of the cons uh, is that oftentimes you can't get all the product right out of the bottom of the tank. They just don't, um, it, the bottom of the tank doesn't clear, and oftentimes you'll end up with uh, a lot of leftover waste. And this can get into issues with wasted product and also with uh, um, uh, cross contamination potentially. You know, it's a lot of leftover product. You got to figure out how I can mix this into my other, you know, my next tank so that I'm not cross contaminating my fungicide with my insecticide, which would be a very bad thing, obviously. Um, and they're not typically easy to use with multiple products. Like I say, I'm backpedaling a little bit on that because some of the configurations that are coming out now are starting to accommodate that a little bit more. So that's just something to look at. Uh, but if it's all large tanks, you know, 125 gallons and more, that it can sometimes be an issue. We also have medium volume trucks, and I would say that this is the direction that we've moved um, a lot because a 
a lot of what we do is uh, fertilization on these larger trucks. So a lot of what we do now is looking at these medium trucks. Just gives us a lot more um, uh, ability to accommodate all sorts of different services out of one singular truck. <clears throat> we still have a need to have a, a, a reasonable volume, so they carry about 300 gallons. And uh, for us, the majority of the time that we're mixing up higher volumes is during our uh, um, foliar fungicide applications, you know, right away in the spring, where we need to have multiple trucks that have this capacity. Uh, so we have one nurse tank that holds uh, water. We have multiple mix tanks that give you, gives you that versatility. They have a little bit smaller pumps. Uh, these are more than adequate for what we uh, have them doing. Still have two hoses. They do run off of uh, separate motors. Um, so they, they have uh, separate Honda motors is what we use. And we found that we can operate these both on one ton pickups and then, uh, um, or three quarter ton pickups and then also vans. There's a lot of crossover um, utility vans that are coming out in the marketplace right now, um, like the Sprinter, um, so on and so forth. And they, I think they provide a little bit more professional look uh, started to, to go that direction. So like I say, um, some of the pros in this are that you have multiple tanks. Uh, you can have concealed tanks oftentimes if you're going with these vans. You can do very small custom batches. So if you're doing many different plant healthcare services all over the course of one day, this uh, creates a way to um, have very little waste. Also very low uh, possibility for cross-contamination. Um, one of the cons, unless you have a completely water-soluble uh, product for your fertilizer, um, we, we don't fertilize out of these trucks. And then we have the lowest volume. And really, this is the, the spot that I, I see a lot of plant health care companies start. It's a very simple, cheap way to get into the marketplace. Um, oftentimes, it's just a, a single skid unit with one tank in the back of it. And, uh, and one uh, hose, and they are great. We still, we still use them when we're just out you know, do, delivering one particular service. They're easy to pull out of a pickup and um, slide in and out of a pickup and create you know, lots of great multiple use. Uh, yeah, so that's, the, that's kind of the base, base model. Other tools that we use regularly um, are the, uh, our soil probes with our fertilization service. Uh, the HTI, we've switched over to completely doing all of our uh, soil applications with uh, HTI, which are soil applied insecticides as well as growth regulators. Um, we found that uh, we've found significant cost savings in the amount of product that we can put down. Um, and then we also use uh, um, spray guns, uh, of course, to deliver insecticide and on the job site, um, I'm going to go through just a little bit of what our team actually sees that uh, gives them the ability to do their job um, very well. And so these are the very specific uh, types of work orders that we're providing um, to our crew that clearly communicates uh, what the expectation was with the, uh, uh, the salesperson to what we're actually going to deliver. We also map. Um, when you're hiring on a lot of different uh, folks, there are, you may have people that can identify trees and you may have folks that, that can't. And even the best arborists uh, sometimes have some difficulty at identifying uh, trees accurately. So to remove a lot of the question, uh, we actually map and number all of our trees. Uh, if you get into a forested situation, that's a little bit different story, and there's ways to handle that with tags and things like that. But we map out all of our properties, and we, we things are, are fairly consistent. So, you know, the if we're going out to, to spray apple scab on tree number one there on the left-hand side of the house, it's much easier to identify and figure out if you're if you're if you struggle with knowing exactly what a crab apple looks like versus a hawthorn on the other side. When we're on the site, we always notify the customers of our arrival. That's just customary, you know, and especially if we're spraying, we have to make sure the windows are closed. 
um, and find out if there's any questions, if there's going to be any pets around. All of our technicians, regardless of what role they're in, um, they do a job site assessment looking for hazards. If you're spraying, moving and covering targets, windows, review the work order and identify the trees. Make sure we're delivering um, the, the right product and the right uh, um, service that we said we would. Then we deliver the service. We always restore the yard to the better um, than, it, than it was originally uh, found. Uh, customers always seem to notice uh, the way you leave their yard versus the fantastic job you do. So we really try and instill that um, within our technicians to always leave a little bit better than uh, they found it. And then we leave a door hanger um, explaining exactly what we do. And this is required by the Department of Ag. But then we elaborate just a little bit further on um, exactly what it is that we applied and any other directions that we might have um, for customers to um, better manage that tree um, while we're not there in order to make sure that, uh, that whatever treatment we gave it is going to work at its maximum level. So in the results, kind of stepping back a little bit here now um, and walking through kind of an entire overview of a plant health care program, we have, uh, we do definitely follow metrics uh, very carefully to make sure that we're on track. And like I say, we're not just looking at the quality of the efficiency and the profitability, which um, keeps our businesses running, but equally uh, making sure that we have a clear understanding of safety. You know, what types of incidents are happening out there with your team? Uh, what's the quality look like? Um, that we're delivering? What kind of customer satisfaction um, are we bringing? How many return trips uh, did we have to make because of errors, either, you know, whatever error happened to happen? And then what are the expectations and what are we working on for the following week? So everything that I, I, I had communicated earlier, these teams are coming back together and working with their supervisor and having weekly conversations on uh, on all of these different types of metrics um, so that they can deliver their job and uh, be satisfied in their role, um, know exactly what's expected, um, know how they're making a contribution to your company. You know, they're an important, a critical piece. Probably spend more time in front of your customers than, uh, you know, most of us on this webinar might. So uh, having clear key metrics that you're following and tracking and expectations uh, goes a long way to uh, um, employee satisfaction. And that is what I had, Peter. So are there any questions that you'd like to field? All right. Well, thanks, Ben. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to type those into the questions and chat box right now. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, for your ISAFE CEU, uh, make sure to also type in your uh, ISA certification number, uh, and then we'll make sure that uh, we get those uh, uploaded uh, in, and uh, get you your CEUs for attending this webinar. All right, so we're just going to take a look at the uh, some of the questions here. Uh, we've got one, will the PowerPoint be available uh, after the webinar? Uh, yes, uh, as Ben mentioned earlier, uh, we will have the uh, PowerPoint in a PDF uh, version uh, available. Uh, and we'll make sure to send that out uh, to all of you uh, with a link uh, to download that. All right. Let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, we'll hang on the line here just to see if any, any of them come in. All right, so we've got a question here from uh, Gary. Uh, notice you're treating Tabaki uh, with Alamo. Uh, what is your rate? Yeah, um, Gary, uh, that's a, <clears throat> that is a good question. We do have quite a bit of Tabaki uh, um, showing up here um, in the Twin Cities probably over the last like five years. We've had inconsistent uh, results, which I think is uh, is fairly common and consistent with uh, some of the folks at Iowa State who have uh, done some of the research. So we probably have like, I would say, a 
50-50 with our with our Alamo treatments um, on that on that particular uh, issue. Currently, we're treating at 10 uh, mills um, on on the Brooks. This year, we're actually going to um, bump that up a little bit to to 12, and then we're actually also doing a uh, trial here locally with the city of Minnetonka um, to look at a few different options um, for Tabakia um, within our within our own company. But yeah, it's a it's a tough one. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. All right, another question here. Uh, where can I rewatch this? A very good question. We'll also have this recorded webinar uh, available on our website, uh, and we'll also send that link in that email with uh, the PDF also. So if you want to share this, you can uh, certainly do that off of our website, uh, treatcarescience.com. All right, uh, looks like we have another follow-up one here around Tabakia, uh, Ben. Uh, are you... Yeah, that's accurate. Okay. Uh, Tubakia, uh, Actinopelte, yes, uh, referring to the same uh, uh, fungus. All right. Got another question here. Uh, do you provide production incentives and rewards to your PhD test? Yeah, Megan, um, we've gone uh, kind of full circle on that. We don't provide weekly <clears throat> or monthly incentives. Uh, we provide an end of the year um, incentive uh, for the team that they all work for together. So it's a it's it's a team and it's a financial incentive and it's related to all those different metrics um, that I mentioned on that last slide. So it gives them a little bit longer term perspective. The thing the thing around incentives that we found sometimes didn't work was if, especially if they were structured around efficiency and profitability, is that your quality um, went down pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, so we have a, a bigger, longer term game um, for our, our technical team. Okay. Uh, another question here, are your tech salary or hourly? Yeah, Gary, our technicians are all hourly. Okay. Uh, we'll stay on the line here for uh, a couple more seconds here to see if there are any more questions. And again, uh, I would remind you if you're interested in learning more about saluting branches, uh, go to uh, salutingbranches.org. It's, uh, it's a great cause. It's very important to uh, what we do, and it, it makes a, a big difference uh, in the industry. Uh, questions just came in. How do we get ISA credits? Uh, again, just uh, type in your ISA certification number. Uh, into the same questions and chat box that you've been uh, typing into, and uh, we'll make sure that you get your ISA credit uh, for attending this webinar. All right, we've got another question here. Uh, how big are your IPM crews? Yeah, Marco, um, our IPM crews are typically um, just individuals. Um, on occasion, if we have large, uh, large enough commercial properties, uh, we'll we'll pair folks up on a truck. Um, as we get into other types of injections, like our tree injection crews that are doing uh, elms and oaks, are typically three-person crews. We found are are fairly efficient um, in the way that they can move through work. Uh, and also, with you know, with some of our ash crews, if we're doing you know, larger commercial and municipal contracts, it really kind of depends. You know, we might have 10 uh, technicians all paired up, but our standard IPM crews are, are one individual that are out. All right. We've got a question here around saluting branches. Uh, is there a definition slash requirement for a cemetery being used for saluting branches uh, that, may, that we might ask to work with in the program? Um, let's see here. Question about three branches. Yeah, as, as far as the as who qualifies, I, I think that's what you're asking. What you know, is there a specific qualification for a cemetery um, to be involved in saluting branches? And there there isn't. That's actually one of the things that we've taken away. It needs to be a veteran cemetery, but it doesn't need to be um, a, a national cemetery, which is where we really started this. 
So we have had a few um, state uh, cemeteries, state veteran cemeteries that have now been a part of it. So if you do have another uh, location that you'd like to inquire about or, or uh, possibly add on, you can go onto the website and there is a spot um, to request um, that particular cemetery. So that's where I would take that. Okay, we've got another question here. Are you anticipating the loss of midocoprid? Uh, if so, have you developed alternate treatment protocols? Um, that's a good question. Uh, we, I don't know that I'm anticipating that there are alternatives. I mean, I think it's, you know, imidacloprid is a fantastic tool in the toolbox and needs to be used um, in appropriate spots. Uh, but we do have alternatives. Um, you know, we've, we've looked at uh, amamectin benzoate treatments in certain uh, um, scenarios. We've looked at uh, Dinotefron, as well as uh, Lepitex, which is uh, acephate, um, as other alternatives to, to where we might not necessarily be able to use imidacloprid. Okay, we'll see if there's any more questions here. All right, well, I think we'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and uh, we hope you got uh, value out of this webinar. Uh, once you uh, log off, you will be prompted uh, to fill out a survey. If you could fill that, it's totally voluntary. Uh, if you could fill that out, that would be much appreciated. We're always looking at ways to uh, improve what we do from an education standpoint here at uh, Rainbow Trigger Scientific Advancement. So again, thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day.